Well, central to everything that's happening here in Glasgow for COP26 is the science. For once, almost no voices are questioning anything. What we're seeing now is science, which, which is more or less saying, we don't know everything, but we think it's getting worse than even we were predicting maybe a year or two ago. And I'm joined by Johan Rockström, who's director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Now, Johan, you can make us all feel dreadful with some of the science, but the science is really quite gloomy. What mm. are you saying now about what you call planetary boundaries? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the science provides just the latest knowledge, so we have to have that right diagnostic. And the latest science shows that we're transgressing four of the nine planetary boundaries that we have unequivocal scientific evidence that they regulate the state of the entire planet and thereby also the climate system. So it's not only that we've gone too far on climate, we've also gone too far on degrading biodiversity, land system change, which is deforestation, overuse of nitrogen and phosphorus, which is also a very important greenhouse gas, but also fundamentally um, overusing uh, the, the whole land system changes across all big biomes in the Earth system. And this puts at risk the stability of the Earth system because the setting scientifically of the planetary boundaries is to avoid crossing tipping points. And we know today 15 to 20 big biophysical systems that uh, if they stay in the right state, support us by cooling and dampening warming. So but nature cross, helps us at the moment. Nature helps us. In fact, nature, we have quantified this, the IPCC confirms this, that 56% of the emission of greenhouse gases caused by fossil fuel burning are taken up in ocean and land-based ecosystems. So, so far, the Earth system is, has been so resilient that it's been able to stay in a, in a Holocene. Holocene is the period since we left the last ice age that has been the prerequisite for civilizational development as we know it. And the planetary boundaries are the scientific guardrails or, or targets that give us the safe space to remain in a stable state. Now that we have passed four of them, we start seeing the invoices coming back to the economies. And that's why we see larger frequency and severity of extreme events. We see tipping points actually very likely having been crossed already in, our, in, the, in the Arctic, uh, in parts of uh, tropical coral reef systems, in West Antarctic ice shelves which very likely have already started to irreversibly move in a direction that gets just less and less able to provide life support for us humans, but also stability for the planet. So we're really in a danger zone. In fact, it's what we today define as a planetary emergency, because if we continue pushing these systems further, we are at risk of unleashing even further tipping points, which would lead from you know, dampening and cooling to self-amplifying and warming. And that's the exactly what we you know, have to put all our efforts to avoid. That's the kind of the, the ultimate um, you know, risk analysis to avoid crossing tipping points that would lead to irreversible change. So just to be clear, what you're saying is tipping points you thought were somewhere in the future. We're now beginning to pass them much quicker than we expected. That's correct. Scientifically, we, we know of in the order of 15 big tipping point systems, we published just um, one and a half year ago an analysis showing that nine out of these 15 are showing signs of instability. Not that they've crossed tipping points, but that they are approaching tipping points. Among those nines, you have the Arctic sea ice, the Greenland ice sheet, the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, the Amazon rainforest, the West Antarctic ice shelf, tropical coral reefs, permafrost systems, large, biophysical systems and among those nine we can unfortunately scientifically you know declare the first victims already in terms of very likely having cross tipping points already at 1.1 degrees celsius and that is the arctic sea ice that is tropical coral reef systems and that's the west antarctic ice shelf so i would argue that we have you know not only the science that unequivocally gives us the support for action we have already just from the observations in the real world um, you know, very, very strong, uh, you know, evidence that, you know, now is the time to rapidly turn away from continued global warming. Is it accepted now, the direction of travel, or are you still fighting an uphill battle to get people to understand this? Well, scientifically, there's no uphill battle at all. Uh, I would argue that, you know, over the last 10 years, quite interestingly, there's been opinion polls uh, led, particularly from Yale University, but increasingly <clears throat> also here in Europe, we find that 70% of citizens across the world 
are uh, deeply concerned about climate change, they uh, trust climate science, and they want climate action. So among citizens, there's since quite some time been a you know, much, much higher level of concern and awareness than we normally see in media or in policy, politics. Here at COP26 in Glasgow, I think we've really turned a corner because over essentially 25 COP meetings, we've always had this debate on the direction of travel. There's been uh, you know, groups of countries that have completely dug in. We've had basically trench wars. We've had completely stalled uh, periods of days where all the negotiations have been postponed because of inability to even agree on whether or not we have a problem. Now at COP26, the direction of travel is not debated anymore. It's rather the pace of change that we still have laggards versus we have alliances of more rapidly acting countries. So I think that's a, a really significant shift that now we are so say, not questioning the science and the need to transition towards a fossil fuel free world economy. We have, as we've seen just over the last few days, remarkable, actually remarkable pledges on halting deforestation, the recognition that carbon sinks in nature are fundamental to deliver the Paris Agreement. Still, it's going too slow, nations are not ramping up in line with science entirely, but it's rather the speed of change rather than debating the direction. Let me put to you, Johan, what has happened in the Northern Hemisphere summer period, whether it be in Siberia, in Maharashtra, in uh, Central Europe, in Germany, what you saw in Lytton in British Columbia, what about what? What are you deducing now? Those who mm. are not reading your scientific papers about the jet stream and the Gulf Stream, mm. and what is therefore happening, which is different mm. to everything we've taken for granted up to now? Yeah, no. So this is science frontier. It is, if anything, what makes uh, me and many of my colleagues most nervous of all, because it's not only that we have identified the tipping point systems in the Earth system, not only that we have identified that nine out of fifteen are moving in the wrong direction. It's also that we are learning more and more that these tipping element systems are connected in what we call cascades. So, you know, what happened in the Northern Hemisphere in summer 2021 was not a series of extremes. These were super extremes. And the question is, how could it be that Lytton got 49.6 degrees Celsius of warming and then two weeks later burned down when that is so far out of the normal that you can talk of, you know, super extremes that are difficult to explain just as a freak event? And we have scientifically a candidate for this, which, yes, is when the Arctic melts so fast. In fact, the Arctic is warming two, three times faster than the global mean average, melting very fast, warming up the atmosphere, slowing down the jet stream. When the jet stream slows down, which is you know, the high wind system that leads to the travel of high, low pressure weather system across the northern Atlantic, it starts meandering. And these meanders lead to lock-in, blockages of high, low pressure systems. So we cannot exclude that what happened in Lytton, that what happened in the, you know, devastating floods in Germany this summer could be blockages of high low pressure systems, extreme rainfall in Germany, extreme heat in Canada because of a meandering jet stream if we'd because of the year Arctic, ago, if Arctic we'd warming. If we a year ago, would you have warned about that? One year ago, there were a handful of scientific papers out warning about this. In fact, there was a paper uh, following the heat wave in 2018 in Europe. Uh, warning that this could be the case. Uh, we've had an extreme, you remember the winter in the US, 2017, the highest electricity bills ever, that there was a scientific paper warning about this. So that's how science advances. You get scientific groups starting to find evidence, but it takes some time before we can say in, in settings like this that, yes, we now have enough confidence to say that, yes, this is very likely the explanation. So, no, two years back, I wouldn't be able to say with confidence that this is the explanation. We cannot even say today that this is exactly for certain, but we've come long enough, far enough, to see that we have interconnections between tipping elements. I mean, the other one, which is even more dramatic, is that when the green ice sheet melts so fast, it releases cold, fresh water into the North Atlantic. That is slowing down the whole overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, the so-called AMOC, which in turn pushes the monsoon systems further south which can explain why we get more droughts and forest fires over the Amazon rainforest, which of course pushes that system closer to a tipping point. So, I need so you to have cascades. So I need to ask you, sadly, we're going to have to bring this to, to a close, but when it comes to talking to the politicians who've got to take policy decisions 
and convince their public within electoral cycles that this is an urgency. It's not for 2070, 2060. It's actually for a few years down the track, and they've got to change. What's your feeling about whether they're taking seriously the science that you are uh, analyzing? Mm. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's why I, I talk of this as us having entered the decisive decade for humanity's future because this is the turnaround point, and it's a turnaround point to avoid that we drift off in this irreversible direction. What I'm seeing here at COP with the political leadership is that this is starting to sink in, but not, not beyond the incremental leadership, that this is now a transformative moment and it has to scale at the entire global level. I mean, that's the big drama now, that if it had been 20 years ago, we could have accepted four, five, six economies lagging behind. But now everyone has to sing the same tune at scale. So of course, there's a drama here, and, and I really hope that the science is at the forefront as, as a constructive stress factor for that political leadership. Johan Rockström, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.